All right, good morning or good afternoon. It depends on when you're obviously doing this reading. We're going to be looking at Activity 37, the History of the Germ Theory of Disease. We're not going to read this introduction. We're just going to skip right down to the reading. That starts right here. You will also need your key to the timeline of germ theory of disease. We'll come back to that here in just a few minutes. Okay, cast of characters. Let's look at uh, Robert Hooke here from 1635 to 1703. The late 17th century was a period of great scientific discovery. While many people offered theories about experimentation or evidence, English scientist Robert Hooke believed that good science resulted from making observations on what you could see. In his 20s, he wrote, a, he wrote a book on observations and drawings of the natural world called Micrographia, meaning tiny drawings. It was first published in 1665. In this one book, he presented his ideas about the life cycle of mosquitoes, the origin of craters on the moon, and fossils. The hook is most remembered for including drawings of what he saw through a microscope. This picture of Hook's microscope. <clears throat> Hook developed his own version of the compound microscope, pictured above, and is one of the best available and was one of the best available at the time. Today, his most famous drawing from Micrographia is a drawing of cork, the same kind of cork that is used to cork boards and bottle stoppers. Since cork is made from the bark of a cork oak tree, it is essentially dead plant tissue. Using his microscope, Hook looked at, looked at the very tiny slicey, slices of cork. He noticed what looked like little rooms below right. Because of this, he called these shaped cells, another word for rooms. With this simple observation, Hook introduced an idea that would become the basis of new fields in biology, but not for almost 200 years. So here's a picture of a cork tree, and this is a microscopic view of cork cells. So this is what Hook was looking at a long time ago. Now, on to the next, next uh, scientist, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek, from 1632 to 1723. Antoine van Leeuwenhoek was a cloth salesman in Holland and an amateur scientist. He knew how to make very simple microscopes. Today, they would be considered magnifying lenses. But he did not become interested in studying the microscopic world until he read Hooke's Micrographia which was a very popular book at the time. Leeuwenhoek's still skill at building microscopes, like the one shown on the left, enabled him to magnify objects over 200 pounds. This, combined with his curiosity, led to observations almost identical to those which he made in Activity 36, looking at signs of microlife. Now, we're actually doing things a little bit out of order. We will come back to Activity 36, okay? So don't, if you're wondering, like, what does that mean? Or, I don't remember doing that because you haven't yet, so not to worry. In 1673, Leeuwenhoek described what he saw in a drop of water. Wretched beasts. They stop, they stand still, and they turn themselves around. They are no bigger than a fine grain of sand. By examining scrapings from his teeth, he found additional evidence of these many, very little living animals. Very prettily and moving. Leeuwenhoek was one of the first people to observe and record microbes. He continued his observations until the end of his life. Okay, so Leeuwenhoek's microscope, the small hole in the board, contained the magnifying lens. The material to be observed was placed on the point in the front of the lens. So right here. Look at the picture of the green. So how Leeuwenhoek describes spirogyra. Look at the picture, picture of the green algae Spirogyra, shown to the right. Since Leeuwenhoek was not a good artist, he, he wrote very precise descriptions of his observations. In addition, he hired someone to make drawings to go with his descriptions. On September 7, 1674, he described Spirogyra, which he found on lakes. <laughs> Passing just lately... Over this lake and examining this water the next day, I found floating some green streaks, spirally wound serpent-wise. The whole circumference of each of these streaks was about the thickness of a hair of one's head. All consisted of very small green globules joined together. And there were very many small green globules as well. How do Layman Hook's description of microlife compare with your own? Again, don't worry about answering that. 
down to the next set of scientists. And I think we can go back to our key to the uh, timeline of the germ theory of disease. Here we go. We, we have Hooke in 1665. Drawings of cells from cork plants first published. Leeuwenhoek. Microbes first described. So he was the first scientist to observe microscopic life under a microscope and describe them. All right, back to the reading. Mathis, Jacob Schleden, Theodore Schwann, Carl Theodore Ernst von Siebold. Over the next 150 years, scientists continued to use the microscope to study living organisms such as plants, insects, and microbes. But by the early 1800s, most botanists, scientists who study plants, were not using microscopes. They were busy naming and describing entire plants. German biologist Mathias Schleden was an exception. Although he trained as a lawyer, he left the law to become a professor of botany. Schleden preferred to use a microscope to study plants. Look at the plant cells in the margin column to see what Schleden may have seen. Based on his study, he suggested in 1838 that all plants are made of cells. This was a completely new idea. Just as a house could be made up of entirely of bricks, plants were made up entirely of cells. Schleden knew another German bi uh, biology professor, Theodore Schwann, who spent his time studying animals. Schwann was particularly interested in the digestive system. In 1839, one year after Schleden proposed his theory, Schwann suggested that animals, and not just plants, were made of cells. You can see animal cells in the margin column photo. Because of their ideas, Schleden and Schwann are credited with developing the cell theory, that all living organisms are made of cells. Other scientists have began to build on Schleden and Schwann's ideas. In 1845, Carl Theodor Ernst von Siebold suggested that microbes were also made up of cells, or more specifically, one cell. See the microbe cell photo in the margin column. In fact, Siebel believed that organisms made up of many cells, like animals, were built out of single-celled microbes. While Siebold was wrong about this idea, he was right in stating that microbes were living creatures made up of the same material as animals and plants. Robert, I'm sorry, Rudolf Karl Verschall. Why is Schleden Schwann's cell theory important for understanding infectious disease? Their work influenced Rudolf Karl Virchow, a Polish doctor. He, been, he had been treating and studying ill patients for many years. He is famous for saying in 1850s, all cells rise from cells, meaning that cells produce, reproduce to create new cells. He was right. When you see a new plant or a baby animal, you see multicellular, many-celled creature. All living organisms begin as a single cell. Most microbes are made up of only a single cell, as Siebold believed. See the section on Schleden, Schwann, and Siebold. The cells of some organisms, like people, continue to divide and grow. An adult human being is made up of about 10 trillion cells. So here you go, plant cells. Plants are made up of cells, like the plant cells shown in the photo above. Animal cells. Animals are made up of cells, like the thin cells shown in the photo above. And we'll talk about more about these when we look at them in, in, for ourselves under a microscope. A microbial cell. Many microbes are made up of just one cell, like the microbe shown in the photo above. You will get to see these uh, when we look at um, the microbes under a microscope coming up in just a couple days. All right, back to our timeline. Talk about Schleden. All plants are made of cells. Schwann. All animals are made of cells, and Siebold, many microbes are made up of a single cell. So go ahead and fill out your timeline. Back to the reading. Virchow applied his ideas to disease. He knew that all cells grow from other cells. He thought that all diseases are caused by cells that do not work properly. He believed that disease cells came from other usually healthy cells of sick persons. Virchow's ideas about disease were not completely correct, although they are correct for some diseases. His ideas were based on his work with leukemia, which is a cancer of the blood. Cancer and other hereditary diseases are diseases of the cell. They are caused by cells that do not work properly. 
Infectious diseases are different, as scientists off after Virchow discovered. Did you know that each one of these organisms is multicellular? Each is made up of millions of cells. Could you collect evidence of this with a microscope? Or you could collect evidence of this with a microscope. Ignaz Philip Selimowitz, 1818-1865. At the same time that Schleden, Schwann, and Siebel were developing their ideas on cells, a Hungarian doctor working in Australia was trying to prevent young people from dying. It was the 1840s, and pregnant women <coughs> excuse me, often dies, died of a disease called childbed fever. Dr. Selma Louise noticed that many pregnant women were examined by doctors who had just completed an autopsy. He also discovered another doctor died of childbed fever after he cut himself on the scalpel he was using to perform an autopsy. Selma Louise concluded that childbed fever must be infectious and could be spread from something found in dead bodies. He believed that doctors were carrying the disease from patient to patient. Selma Louise decided to try hand washing by washing his hands between patients. As a result, fewer of his patients died. In two years, he reduced the death rate among his patients from 12% to 1%. He encouraged other doctors to use a strong chemical solution to wash their hands between patients. But because some of these could not explain why washing hands worked, many doctors refused to change their ways. Some of these tried to get hospitals to change their policies, but many people resisted his ideas. He eventually suffered a mental breakdown and died soon after. Within 10 years of his death, of his death the development of the germ theory of disease would explain what he could not. The hand washing reduces the risk of infectious disease by removing germs like the ones shown at left. Today, childbed fever is called purpillar infection. It is caused by several different microbes, including streptococcus, which is strep throat. Louis Pasteur, 1822 to 1895. Louis Pasteur, a French chemist, began studying microbes in 1864. He was working on an important business in France, the fermentation of wine and, and vinegar. He noticed that certain microbes could cause food and drink to spoil. Pasteur discovered that different microbes cause different kinds of spoiling, but heat can kill many of these microbes. Today, because of his work, milk is heated to 71 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds to kill the microbes that cause tuberculosis. Using heat to kill microbes is known as pasteurization in Pasteur's honor. Look at the milk carton shown at the right. The word pasteurized on milk sold in stores tells you that the milk is safe to drink. It is pasteurized milk. Pasteurization kills microbes that, can, that may be present in milk. In 1865, Pasteur was was asked to help the silk industry in France, of France, which was having problems with silk production. Silk is produced from thread spun by a worm known as the silkworm. Pasteur observed a microbe that was infecting the silkworm and leaves that they ate. When he recommended that the worms and their food be destroyed, the silk industry was saved. Pasteur knew that some diseases were infectious. He suggested that microbes, with which he referred to as germs, could cause infectious disease that were easily spread by people. This idea of the, is the basis of the germ theory of disease. Robert Cook, 1843-1910 Slowly, the role of microbes in causing infectious disease began to be accepted, but there was still more work to do. Some microbes caused which microbes caused which disease? In 1876, Robert Cook, a German doctor, identified the microbe that caused anthrax, an infectious disease that was killing cattle. He later went on to identify the microbes that caused tuberculosis and cholera. Amazingly, he did all his work in the four-room apartment that he shared with his wife. Cook developed a way to prove that a specific microbe caused a particular disease. In the case of anthrax, he injected healthy mice with blood taken from farm animals that died of anthrax. He injected another group of healthy mice with blood taken from healthy farm animals. All the mice injected with the blood from the infected animals died of anthrax. None of, none of the other group of mice developed anthrax. He then showed that he could isolate anthrax microbes only from the mice that were injected with blood from infected animals. He did not find anthrax mi microbes in the healthy mice. 
In this way, Cook was able to provide scientific evidence that anthrax microbes cause anthrax. The figure shown below summarizes this experiment. The substance inside this dish is known as agar. Many kinds of microbes can grow in agar, which provides food for the microbes. Cook also created new ways to grow cultures of uncontaminated microbes. In particular, he developed agar, a gelatin-like substance which is used to grow microbe cultures. Agar is still used today, as you will find out in Activity 47, Reducing Risk. So Cook's, Cook is, uh, Cook's experiment. Healthy mice injected with blood from cow with anthrax. Mice die. Anthrax microbes can be isolated from the blood of infected mice. Infected mice. Healthy mice injected with healthy cow blood. Mice live. No anthrax microbes in the blood of healthy mice. Okay. Let's go back to our germ theory of disease. Or the timeline here. So we talked about cell Louise. Hand washing reduced the spread of child dead fever among patients. Per chow, cells reproduce to grow new cells. And then we're going to go back and talk about Florence Nightingale. Joseph Lister, you ever heard of Listerine? That's because of this guy, Joseph Lister, and William Stewart Halstead. Ideas such as those as Pasteur and Cook were very important in the fields of medicine. Florence Nightingale, an English nurse, published her ideas on disease in 1816. At the time, the idea of cleanliness was important. Was it important in preventing disease? Was not as common. Was not a common one. I apologize. She was one of the first to recognize the values of cleanliness and recommended it be a part of good nursing. Her efforts improved sanitary practices in military hospitals and led to fewer soldiers dying from infections due to contaminated battle injuries. Scottish surgeon Joseph Lister had been concerned at the high death rates of patients following surgery. Surgery would be complicated, would be completed successfully, but 45% of the patients would die of infectious infections afterward. When Lister heard about Pasteur's germ theory of disease, he came up with the idea of killing germs with chemicals. In 1867, he began using an antiseptic to clean surgical instruments. He also sprayed the air and required hand washing and clean aprons. As a result, the death rate of patients following surgery dropped 15%. Here's a picture of Florence Nightingale, by the way. American surgeon William Halstead took these ideas one step further. Instead of just trying to kill the microbes once they were there, why not try to prevent them from being spread in the first place? In 1890, Halstead became one of the first surgeons to use rubber gloves during surgery. The gloves could be sterilized with heat and chemicals that were too hard on human hands. This helped reduce the presence of even more microbes and improve patient health. By 1831, germ theory of disease had become so accepted that ads for disposable tissues read a new era in handkerchief hygiene. One used once and discard, avoiding self-infection from germ-filled handkerchiefs. Here's Joseph Lister supervised an antiseptic that sprayed before surgery. All right, I'm not going to read this. We did talk already about this, the theory of the spontaneous generation once before. I would encourage you to read this on your own. It's kind of, it's very interesting. Again, we've already talked about it. And there are the analysis questions. All right, so let's go back to the timeline. So here we have uh, Virchow. We already talked about that. Nightingale, cleanliness recognized as important in patient care. Pasture, microbes, also known as germs, can cause infectious disease. Infections or infectious disease can be spread by the spread of microbes. Lister, chemicals can be used to reduce the spread of microbes. Cook, specific microbes can cause specific diseases. And Halstead, gloves used during surgery can prevent the spread of microbes. Make sure you fill out your timeline. Let me zoom out a little, maybe that will help you see it. There is the germ theory of, or the key to the timeline of the germ theory disease. So you might want to pause it now, make sure you get all this copied down correct. Thank you for listening and have a great rest of your day.